Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagan Radian here at the Excel Center where we're covering the DSCI trade show. We're covering this show, one of the world's leading air, land, sea, cyber, and security expositions in partnership with DSCI and Clarion Events. And we're honored to have with us uh, the former first sea lord of the Royal Navy, uh, Admiral Sir George Zambellis. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. Hi, Gary. It's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a pleasure. Um, and I should also say that you're a senior advisor to Liquid Robotics, which is a leading underwater uh, systems company. It's, it's part of Boeing. But what I more wanted to talk to you is in the main, in the lecture that you just, just gave here uh, in the Naval Theater, which was um, about the role of autonomous systems. You were very much fostered that when you were in the Royal Navy. A uh, mutual friend of ours from Bluebell, Yog Patel, was, was talking about the importance of the exercise that you uh, sponsored to get surface and undersea systems and network them together uh, in, a, in, a, in an exercise. Have militaries wrapped their minds around how dramatically these autonomous systems are going to change the world, whether airborne systems, sea surface systems, because you were a naval aviator, um, or, or undersea systems? Are we at a point where militaries understand fully the ramifications of these systems over the long term? Yes, I believe they they do understand across all services. There's not, there's not a particular domain that leads here. Um, but I think the difficulty is that everybody is trying to carve a path ahead um, and to understand exactly what this technology is going to produce. So, like so many things in life, it needs very aggressive leadership and resource to make it happen. Do you, um, what do you think are the keys because your, your uh, discussion was in part uh, people thinking faster, acquisition systems moving faster, and some fundamental changes. Fundamental changes from the education system, uh, even at a childhood level, the education system, which you were talking about in, in part because technology has so dramatically changed how people learn. Um, talk to us about the whole piece on how the organism itself has to change uh, in order to make best use of these systems. I think really at the heart of what you've just asked me is this issue of whether uh, we as leaders and uh, technology imaginers can meet the expectation of the generations who are coming up behind us. So those who are responsible for education or technology or warfare, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same principle. We have to make sure that we move as fast as we can to empower them and give them the opportunity in life they need. Where do you see, um, one of the questions was a law of war question, um, and prominent artificial intelligence CEOs in that business have written to the United Nations uh, talking about the military implications of it and, and the, the necessity to sort of govern them on a certain level. Um, and friends of mine who were working on this issue, whether with Bob Work in, in DOD, but elsewhere around the world, were saying this is a very big challenge because there are countries that will follow the laws and there are nations that will completely ignore them. That's correct. Um, and we've been through this, whether papal degrees against crossbows and a whole bunch of other things, mm. and, and some have worked and some haven't. Um, what's, what's the right approach to take when you're going into a world where adversaries will feel very unencumbered, right? Royal Navy was one of the things that said, well, submarines are underhand, we're not going to use them. Well, there were other people who used them with great effect against the Royal Navy. Correct. This is a, a classic, King Canute, forget it, it's coming. Uh, the law will be too slow and too low to catch up. Um, the advantages in medicine, education, um, and elsewhere in our the softer but important parts of our society will prove the value of machine learning and um, collective intelligence of, of technology. And so war is just a subset of that equation. To try and remove it from the inventory of human development won't work. You might be able to pretend that certain nations are sticking to certain rules, but they'll be disadvantaged overnight by adversaries who don't care, including not state versus state, but individual terrorist uh, action. So I don't believe there's, got, there's any hope at all in trying to uh, control the journey as you've described it. Is there, from your standpoint, as somebody who's spent a lot of time thinking about this, at all a morality question of these autonomous systems deploying weapons? Because for some people, that's the hang up that it's okay if they're used for surveillance, it's okay as long as they shoot a weapon, as long as there's a human in the loop, for example, like the Reaper system, which the UK is using, the United States, obviously a number of other allied countries. Do, do you see a moral question there at all? Or is this really? It's not a new moral question, Vargo. The moral questions have existed 
ever since that we've had collateral damage in war or landmines that have removed the limbs of innocent children. Um, the nature of war is a filthy and difficult business and all you can do is apply as much um, morality to the construct around war but recognize it's, uh, it's part of human nature and I'm afraid that the, the journey of technology is going to unleash all sorts of uh, additional unpleasant characteristics which are a direct product of the creativity that we humans put into machines.